And even you could spend a lifetime in martial arts and feel really good and powerful and, you know, all that and still be kind of off target when it comes to your life's purpose. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and here it is, episode 198. Today, we're talking with Mr. Mark Devine, a former Navy SEAL and author with deep roots in traditional karate. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice each week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and I'm also your host for the show. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to everybody checking us out for the very first time. If there's one element of our sparring gear that we're known for, it's really our boots. While all of our gear is comfortable, durable, lightweight, our sparring boots are the closest thing you're ever going to find to sparring barefoot. Check them out and all of our stuff at whistlekick.com. Mr. Mark Devine is a man I respected long before we set up this conversation. As an author, a SEAL, a legendary coach in the CrossFit community, and proponent of developing mental strength, he's been doing great work for a long time. I knew his background included a fair amount of martial arts, but I had no idea how much or how strongly he attributed his personal growth to that foundation. Mr. Devine, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you being here. Been looking forward to this one. You know, uh, your your name's popped up a, a little bit. We had Coach Amundsen, Greg Amundsen on a few weeks ago, and and you came up in... in a little bit of that conversation, and you're someone that I've respected for a long time. So, listeners, this is this is one of those ones where I get to check off and say, "Hey, I've I've been looking forward to this for a bit." Of course, this is a martial arts show. You've got some kind of martial arts background, and sure. I'm hoping you might tell us about that. How did you get started as a martial artist? Well, I didn't really dive into the dojo until I was 20. So, I, you know, I was from upstate New York, and frankly, there wasn't a dojo <clears throat> for miles around. I just wasn't exposed to it. I first got exposed to it in uh, college. My roommate took up Shotokan, and they had a really small program at Colgate. I was embroiled in my uh, competitive athletics, so swimming and rowing, so I didn't really see the um, – I-, I couldn't make the times work, even though I was interested. I went and watched a few – classes and whatnot. And I saw the changes that um, my roommate underwent as he progressed through his training over the four years I was there. So I was kind of intrigued with it. And then when I went down to um, New York after college and took up a job with a certified public accounting firm um, and uh, was enrolled at NYU getting my MBA, you know, I was was pretty busy, but there was kind of a, a piece missing. And that was a structured endeavor around some sort of, you know, physical training. And obviously, I wasn't going to get into a competitive sport, so I was just running triathlons in the weekends and whatnot. And then one day, I was walking home from work, and I I lived on 23rd Street, actually 22nd Street. And on 23rd Street was the world headquarters of Seido Karate, S-E-I-D-O, founded by Kaicho, or Grandmaster Tadashi Nakamura, you know, a living legend in my mind, at least. Yeah. Um, was sent to the United States by Masayama to head up the Kokanshai organization and had a falling out and big drama around that. And then he started Stato back in the early seventies. At any rate, um, you know, I heard the, the screams and the shouts and the energy coming from the second floor of this building on 23rd street, you know, and I just kind of drawn in there. I, I literally was like, Holy cow, what's that? That sounds really cool. I walked upstairs and there was Nakamura teaching a class. Um, I inquired, and decided right then I was going to do this. So I came back the next day and started my training. And that was um, 1985. Hmm. Well, that's how I got started. Okay. Now, you found it. You found it for a reason. You know, we all end up in martial arts because of, of something. Usually it's a perception that that's going to give us something that we're missing. But it kept you there. So was it because of the realization of that, that structure you mentioned, or was there something else? Well, it was it was a lot of that. The structure really helped. I mean, you know, it's it's nice to have, in a lot of senses, at least at a particular stage in your life, to have a um, a structure and a and a routine and a place to go to train. I mean, that's one of the reasons why CrossFit is 
been so successful is that, you know, they created a place that felt comfortable and was part of your, you know, became your tribe and your place, your third place to go. So, so um, that became my third place. You know, I had work, I had home and I had the dojo. <laughs> and I know, I, I'm sure you appreciate that. And a lot of listeners are like, yep, that's it. You know what I mean? Work, home and the dojo. Yeah. Um, and so that was a lot of it, but that wasn't the main thing. The main thing for me was the changes that I saw in myself. Um, and I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but I realized later on that it came from the integration of the, you know, the hard functional fitness movement, fighting, you know, the outer combined with the uh, Zen practice. Zen was a very, very big part, you know, almost equal part of the training. We weren't so much focused on competitive fighting, even though that wasn't, that was a, certainly an option, but you know, for me, it wasn't of much interest to me. So I really dove into the Zen and we had classes on Zen and, and long sits and weekend retreats at the Zen Mountain Monastery in upstate New York. And so the combination of those two, and I, and I really think that if I had just done one or the other, it would have been, uh, it wouldn't have had the effect and it wouldn't have changed me the way it did. And there's a lot of reasons for that we could go into later, but I think that was, you know, to me, that was it. Like I literally began to be able to observe discrete changes in how I behaved in my thought patterns, in my worldview, in my beliefs, in how other people responded and, you know, reacted to me. And, uh, and that led, you know, it's what I wrote about in my book, the way of the seal that led to literally a profound change in my self identity which led me to leave, you know, being a CPA and, and enter the Navy SEALs as an officer, right? It, it all happened in that four year period that I was in New York training with Nakamura. And, and I give, you know, I, even though there were some predece predecessors and, you know, some prerequisites probably that, that are part of that whole process from my early childhood, but that, that was certainly the main reason that I was, became um, such a passionate fan of, you know, the Eastern training that integrated, you know, meditation with movement. Hmm. Interesting. Do you think that had you not been training martial arts at that time, you would have found SEALs? Never. Okay. Not in a million years. Can, can you I talk still, a little more about that? Yeah. Like it, it, it literally was the, you know, when I, when I left, after a fight session or, you know, after a, after a, a floor session, I felt, I felt physically good. I felt physically exhausted. My mind was clear. It was good. Right. And I went about my day, but nothing really changed in me except for, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the common things that we talk about with the martial arts, I was definitely getting more disciplined. I was getting, you know, more alert. My, was my, I was controlling my mind and my body. I was becoming self-confident as a fighter. All those things were true. But it didn't change my self-identity at a deep, deep level. And it didn't, it didn't connect me to my witnessing self as opposed to my ego and per personality self. Uh, it, it just didn't do that for me. And, and I don't think it can do that. It was the sitting in meditation and the, and the deep practice and learning how to control my mind in, in silence, how to silence it, how to, you know, how to go deeper into self inquiry and begin to ask the questions that needed to be asked. That only happened when I was sitting in silence. Um, and, and frankly, the sitting in silence was best done after a hard workout, right? After, after an hour or an hour and a half of training or more. There was nothing in my life or there is nothing in the Western world, although today we're starting to see some versions of it like Seal Fit and my Kokoro Yoga and, other, and others that can that combines the two the way, at least the way I experience it in Seda. And so at any rate, what I mean by all this is that when I was sitting in silence after long after I had struggled to keep my you know, learn how to concentrate and clear my mind and then able to drop into, you know, uh, a deeper sense of self beyond ego. That's when I started to get the insight and the instinctual urges to move toward uh, a different life. Right. And then I had to define that. I've, I, you know, I had to come back into my 
rational cognition to define what that is. So I would do that by asking more questions and journaling and reflecting. And then I would go back into the silence. And this happened, you know, over a several year period. So it's not a quick process. But out of this came an entirely new sense of wh who I was, what I was meant for, why I'm on this planet, what I stood for. And when I matched that up against the path I had taken based upon the belief systems and the values and the decisions that I made up to that point in my life, which were, you know, kind of spoon fed to me by or planted or, you know, whatever you want to say, you know, kind of grooved there by society, by my family, by, you know, language, all that stuff, then uh, there was a complete mismatch. And so were it not for the silence of the martial arts, tr training the sacred silence, I would never have met what I would call my true self, which was meant to be a warrior. And then I played that out as a seal on the field, you know, on the field, right, in the outer world. I wouldn't have found that had I just stayed, uh, you know, as a competitive athlete, had I just, even if I, you know, even if I was like an Olympic caliber athlete or a professional athlete, it just wouldn't be there for me. You know, that the self-concept wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to sit in silence and connect deeply to my, you know, whatever you want to call that inner force that's driving you in a, in a true direction. So that's the utter truth. You know, the, that's a lot of what I teach these days is how to connect into that deeper self. And it's not something you just go to the dojo and it happens, right? There's a real, there's a real process. And I just happened to be very fortunate to be with a, you know, grand master who understood that, but, you know, and taught it in his own way within his broken English, <laughs> which is really cool. Well, all the best masters speak in broken English. I, I think that's a requirement. <laughs> well, that's because in the old days, all the masters who understood this came from a different culture, but that's changing as well. Right. right? And, and, and I'm being sarcastic there, of course, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, that I'm sure all the listeners know that, but you know, there's sure. something, um, a, a bit romanticized about learning from someone with broken English. And that probably just goes back to watching the karate kid 500 times as I've done and, and seeing Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. You, you mentioned in there, it didn't change overnight. Your, your perspective didn't change overnight and, and it, almost sounds like you're you're kind of casting off the the amount of work that you did in such a short period of time but I'm actually struck in the exact opposite way it sounds like you know you're talking about all this stuff in this 4 year span and that's a, a incredible amount of self-awareness and and personal growth to happen in in that time and were you at all aware of that in the moment Well, yes and no. Um, the work that I'm talking about really has no relation to linear time. So had I been more astute or alert or, you know, not so caught up in my egoic mind, my thinking mind, I might have been able to um, achieve the results in a single sitting. You know, even the Buddha said you can find enlightenment in a single breath if you're present and aware enough, right? So I was just a slow learner in that regard. You know, I had a lot of unwinding to do. You know, it took me nine months before I could even sit in a Zen. You know, the classic beginner Zen practice is just to learn how to concentrate so you can count to 10 without thinking. And frankly, it's, it's brutally hard. And I, I defy anybody on this podcast to do it. Um, you know, unless there's a grandmaster listening, he'll be smiling about this. It, it's really hard if you're really true to yourself about whether you're thinking or not and the different layers of what thought can, can, or how thought can appear, right? For some people, it starts out with, you know, and your, and your voice in your head sounds like a freaking freight train or, you know, a, a rock concert. But once you settle that, all of a sudden you realize that there's all, uh, there's other things going on. There's imagery, there's, there's sensations, there's emotions, there's feelings. And, and also there's subtler thoughts in the form of beliefs or visions or, you know, all this crud. And so you have to go through these layers like peeling an onion. And frankly, like I said, you know, it could take 
it could take a year or two before you can actually sit in total silence and total non-thought or what the Japanese call mu, no thing, no thing going on besides just witnessing the present without, you know, without thinking about thinking about anything. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's very hard. But when you get to that point where you can drop off of drop out or disassociate from that rational egoic, those rational egoic structures, then it doesn't mean you, you are asleep or it doesn't mean you're catatonic or a zombie. You actually are utterly present and 100 percent aware, but you're just aware at a different level. You're aware of so much more. And that awareness leads to those inner drives that I was talking about. And, and I don't know what words are appropriate to use because they're all just words. And it's not it's probably beyond words. But, you know, it could be your soul's drive or, you know, your soul print. I've heard that term before, which is kind of cool. Or, you know, the Buddhists would call it your dharma, right? That's your overarching purpose and reason for being on this planet, you know? I think everyone has that, but very few people tap into it, which is one of the reasons they feel a sense of incompleteness or frustration or, you know, like they're missing something. They're not quite on target, you know? And even you could spend a lifetime in martial arts and feel really good and powerful and, you know, all that and still be kind of off target when it comes to your life's purpose. And so I was just, I guess, very, very fortunate to, I feel very grateful to be able to, or to have stumbled into that, you know, with Nakamura and to have that experience, which was really just the beginning, you know, it was just the opening, the opening act. And um, it's been a lifetime since then. And I realized how even naive I was there, but that led me into the SEALs. And when I went through SEAL training, I literally just destroyed the training and had a blast doing it. And it largely because I was just super clear about why I was there. And there was just no way that I wasn't going to dominate that training and have fun while doing it. Because, you know, I was in that much control over my destiny at that point. And that's pretty cool. That's very cool. And, I, and I'm, I'm struck by that. I've, I've heard enough accounts of what SEAL training is like and, and the fact that you could use the word fun. In it yeah. says a lot about your personality and your approach <laughs> to going through it. It's uh, yeah, and I bet you the, the you know the few percent who make it through and and thrive as Navy SEALs as actual real SEALs, not just Hollywood SEALs, then they'll say something similar. That Buds was fun. That literally they would have had to kill us to get us out, and you know we were there because we desperately wanted to serve our country as SEALs and to be with you know, with teammates who, who thought and uh, acted the same. And, and that's pretty rare quality in our, in our world. And not all SEALs possess that, you know. Um, there's many, you know, especially these days because of the media and the, you know, the sex appeal and whatnot. But there's a lot of people, you know, who still make it into and through buds who really are there for themselves and for their, their own enhancement of ego and to get the pretty girls and whatnot. And that wasn't really as common when I went through. Um, and, and, but there were still some, but what I'm talking about is there, there are those like myself who just went and had a blast. And, uh, you know, I went through training in 1990, there were 185 people in my class, 19 of us graduated. And I graduated as honor man in my class, not because I was some super stud, you know, everyone in the class was a super stud. It's because I showed up every day with a smile on my face. And I was like, this, this is freaking awesome. You know what I mean? This is mm. awesome. I can't even imagine doing anything else today, you know? And that was, that was the attitude. And largely that came from the physical, physical mental conditioning that Nakamura kind of grooved into me of, you know, every moment is awesome. One day, one lifetime, he used to say, you live every day as if it's your last. And um, it's a powerful warrior ethos. For sure. Here on the show, we like to share a lot of things through the vehicle of stories. We always ask our guests, you know, to tell us stories, to, to never shy away from delving into a story and, and you wove some smaller ones together there. I'm sure you've got plenty of others, probably quite a few that you can't share, but I'm wondering if you have any martial arts stories that, you know, kind of pop up to the top, excuse me, that, that, seem like something worth sharing at this time. 
Okay. Do you have any particular um, theme or lesson that you think that you'd like to hear about? I mean, we, we often ask ask it as, "What is your best martial arts story?" Well, I don't. You know, it's interesting. Like, I'm not a fighter. Like I said, I don't. I haven't. Um, since I was an off, since I went to SEAL training and I learned how to really fight, and I'll tell you that story. That's probably appropriate. I haven't been near a fight since then. It's been over 30 years. I'm 53. I mean, it's just never happened. There's never been a compunction or opportunity. And I don't, um, I don't enter competitions because I, I don't look at martial arts as a sport. And that's just my, my view of reality. It, it can be, but it's, to me, it's, um, I don't choose to look at it that way. So, um, you know, I had my black belt when I went to SEAL training and uh, or went to Officer Canada School and then SEAL training. And Officer Canada School, this is before BUDS, before SEAL training, I came home. I was only there for a month. So literally left New York, went up to Newport Royale in Rhode Island. A month later, I was let go for Christmas. So I came back home and went up to Lake Placid where we spent Christmas and went out partying with my brother and went into a bar at like 1.30 in the morning. And, you know, we were three sheets to the wind. And, you know, it was not a good situation. I was not, you know, using my sheepdog skills at the time, let's put it that way. And, you know, I, I said hello to this female bartender, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't like trying to pick her up or anything. I just said hello, kind of. And um, maybe she just picked up some signals that this guy was going to come after her. Because out of the blue, he, she goes, like, Bobby, we got another one. And I, I remember thinking, what the hell was that about? And, some, you know, out of the freaking blue, this this wiry young guy just flies across the room, jumps around my neck, latches on and chokes me out. And I was like, I didn't react. I did not react offensively at all. I just, in partly, partly the alcohol, partly just being stunned and mainly because I wasn't trained. And he choked me out. My brother, you know, pulled him off and I could have, I could have died. It was crazy. And I, that, that had a profound effect on me. Like, holy shit, I've got a black belt. I have a freaking black belt. And I still get choked out by, by a punk at a bar. And so, you know, I was licking my wounds, went, finished the officer candidate school, and I went to SEAL training. And back then, um, in SEAL training, they, they were doing this, this program with a guy named Jerry Peterson, who created a program called SCAR, Special Combat Aggressive Reactionary System. SCARS is based off of San Su Kung Fu, which is an extraordinarily effective combat fighting, offensive fighting system developed by the Chinese mafia or to protect the Chinese mafia. But it's based on, you know, it's based on a combat Tai Chi. Like it is no very serious fighting method. I think, you know, everything I've seen besides Sistema and maybe and Krav between Sistema, Krav and San Su, you got the three most effective like combat fighting systems known to man. So anyways, it's not a martial art to be clear. It is a combat fighting system. So anyways, I step into buds and about a week into the training, we, we trained, I think three times a week for an hour and a half out on the beach with Jerry and his sidekick, Tim Larkin and a couple others. Um, Tony Burr being one of them and a few others. And, um, like very quickly, Jerry came up to me and he's like, Mark, you know, he knew my name and my, you know, um, you know, he, he was very astute at kind of looking at everyone. And, you know, most people had zero skills, but he, he could tell I had some skills. And he looked at me, comes up and he goes, Mark, you got to unlearn that karate. It's slowing you down. And I thought about that. And then I thought about getting choked out just a few months earlier. And I'm like, he's right, you know. Everything I've learned over the past four years is not going to serve me. I mean, it, it will serve me in the fact that I know how to land a structured strike and a kick, and I can do it with a lot of power because I have that physical aptitude. But everything I learned in the physical training of the karate was largely um, about athletics, and it didn't teach me how to fight. It taught me how to defend myself against another person who, you know, essentially is squaring off against me in a karate style of fighting. And, um, that if I really wanted to survive as a Navy SEAL, I had to like leave and let go of a lot of most of what I was, had learned of the, the physical training of karate, not the mental, but the physical, but even the mental had to be rewired. 
And so he proceeded to teach, you know, through that BUDS process. And then I did three five-day seminars when I was at SEAL Team 3 with them. And then I, uh, you know, because I was good and I was really interested in it, I got accepted into their 30-day program, 300 hours of fighting. There are only 300 SEALs that went through that. So rightfully, they call us the 300. There are 300 SEALs that went through this 300 our program, 30 days, 10 hours a day, nonstop scars. It was unreal. And it was not a martial art. It was just pure offensive fighting. Um, no defense, no, no language around blocking or retreating or, or, you know, covering or pairing or anything like that. It was just pure on what's your target? How, what, what weapon are you going to land against that target? How are you going to use proper structure and form? And how are you going to do it with violence of action? So you capture the mind of your opponent and destroy him. And I'll tell you what, that changed everything about the way I viewed martial um, conditioning and, and the martial mind. And um, I never went back to karate. I, I really, you know, I love the training, um, but uh, I, I don't, I kind of do my own thing now, which is a hybrid, you know, of, of different things. So, Back to the story. So I, I learned that after the 300 hour course, which happened you know, early in my career, I think like within two years of me showing up at Team 3, I'd done that. I had done these five day, five, three five day courses plus the 30 day course. Plus I was training consistently pretty much uh, daily or almost daily, you know, given our op op tempo. So I was getting very effective and I had, you know, I had unwound a lot of that karate that Jerry had Jerry talked, which was a nice combination because I had the mental discipline and the focusing skills that Nakamura had taught me and the breath work. But now I was able to combine it with, you know, the, the offensive fighting um, mindset and, and structure that Jerry had taught me. And so it was just very effective. And so what I found was when I went into situations on missions where you know, I was confronted with um, a conflict that the conflicts didn't happen. It was weird. I was, I was almost bummed a few times. We're like, okay, I get to test my skills now. And um, A, I was smart enough to know how to walk away because there literally is only one outcome when you really know how to fight and that's someone's going to get grievously injured and it's not you. I mean, you might sustain some injury. It's very difficult to walk away from a conflict without injury. But if you really know how to fight and you enter a conflict, then it's, you know, it's pretty much you've made the choice that someone's going to get grievously injured or, or die. And so I, I honestly didn't want that to happen to, to even my enemies. You know, so there were situations where I literally just walked away from situations or, you know, uh, um, set it up so, so that the fight didn't, it didn't happen. Now, I'm not talking about like Iraq style combat where I kick the door down and someone, you know, my weapon goes down and someone attacks me in that situation. Obviously I would have used it, but I wasn't exposed to that situation. I was in the seals predominantly active duty before nine 11. And then as a reservist afterward. And so I didn't have to use my skills. What I'm talking about is really like, you know, being in the dark street in, in a, in a foreign land where you're not supposed to be, and using the skills in a different way, right? Using the skills to avoid the conflict, using the skills mentally to scare the living F out of your opponent so that they don't attack you. And that, that's really one of the most valuable things that I've learned through that training. I'm, you know? I'm wondering about for, for the rest of us out here who haven't been through SEAL training, we haven't been to BUDS, we haven't, the vast majority of our listeners have never been in a real real, real life or death combat situation. When you talk about right. the differences talking about, I mean, you're, you're, you're making a comparison that, that the rest of us are, are going to struggle to wrap our brain around. Is there anything you can, you can share to help us relate what we know of as traditional martial arts to what you adopted through SEAL training? Yeah, but it's, it's kind of hard. Um, it takes us a while to unpack this even in our own training. Um, first of all, if you grow up with sport fighting and you, and you encounter a violent offender, whether that's a, a, you know, a highly trained combatant on the field of battle or like a, a street fighter, 
then your your skills are woefully unprepared or you're woefully unprepared and your skills are a complete wrong set of skills to deal with those situations which is why you see a lot of situations where you know a, a trained martial arts artist doesn't do well in those environments um, again because you've trained yourself to expect a certain set of conditions to exist which don't exist in the mind or in the environment of those other combatants right the violent offender or the um or the combatant who's trying to kill you and that's really what jerry was saying you got to unlearn that karate ish because it's slowing you down what he was really saying is you know learning how to sport fight and sparring where you can't hit someone in the balls or the throat or gouge your eyes out or hit a vital organ with the intent to do grievous harm you know that is not going to serve you well when someone else is attacking you with that intent so there's a very there's a there's a dramatic difference between learning how to defend yourself from a street fight or from someone entering your house and trying to attack you than you know even a 20 or 30 year career in the martial arts whether that be karate kung fu or aikido where you're in a, a, a controlled studio environment the whole time and the two are almost like completely different and that's why you know someone says hey what's the best form of self-defense, I would say a weapon, you know, and then the second best is using your mind to avoid the threat, you know, and then the third is learning how to fight with an offensive mindset where with violence and action and proper structure and learning how to apply a weapon to a target, you can do the deed, right, with a limited amount of energy. But that third is your last option, and it's unsavory because there really are three fights you're fighting. I'm sure you're aware. There's three fights. The first fight is the fight over your own mind, you know, being in control and, and winning in your mind before the altercation occurs. That's what I was talking about earlier. When I was in the SEALs and, and in my life, I won that first fight, which meant that I didn't have to go into the second fight. And the second fight is the actual altercation. Unless you're ambushed, that second fight should rarely, rarely happen. There's only a couple cases where that second fight should happen. One is if you're ambushed either on the street or in combat, then you got to fight this or your weapon goes down. The second is if someone's trying to harm someone you love, right? Or, or an innocent bystander in the street. You know what I mean? If someone's in your sheepdog and you see someone, you know, brandishing a weapon, then it's your responsibility to do something. And that's when you, then you, when you bring out the skills. Right. Those are the, the two scenarios where it's OK to use those skills. But generally speaking, when you win in your mind, you know, you don't have to enter the second fight, which is the altercation. Then the third fight, the reason why it's a really bad idea to do everything that I'm talking about, it, it really should be reserved for combatants on the, on, you know, in war zones, is that third fight is the fight with the system. Because if you kill someone or if you, you know, if you maim them, then there will be legal, legal ramifications and you're going to have to do some explaining, you know, and that that could be the hardest part of the whole scenario. Having said that, there's a ton of people we've trained and even Tim Larkin and Jerry continue to do their training. Tim does it under a program called Target Focus Training and Jerry still does run SCARS and now his son Blake is running it for him. They've helped thousands of people really learn how to do what I'm talking about. And uh, the stories that have come out of that have been awesome, you know, in terms of like, you know, women who have been, you know, someone tried to abduct them or their kids and they just literally hauled off and destroyed their opponent. And the opponent was a big, bad, tough guy. And here's, you know, a 50 year old woman who's taken him out. And it's basically from a weekend of training in the way that we learned how to fight. Mm. But like I said, it's different than than a martial art. I look at the martial, a long term martial art as character development cultivating the body, mind, and spirit. And um, I don't look at it as, as really fighting, you know, learning, truly learning how to fight. Because I've been involved in multiple arts. I've, I studied ninjutsu for five years, kempo for five. I did my sado for four. You know, I've, I've never done one long enough because of my travel, you know, to, to advance beyond the shodan. But if you stack it all up and stack up my 40 years of training, not 40, but um, probably like 35, 
you know, had I stayed with Sato, I, I would, my, my peers are all six dons. Probably some of them are seven dons. Um, but I've learned so much more in terms of the, you know, the depth and scope of what it means. Um, it's been a very interesting ride. It was just the journey that I was meant to go on, I guess, in, in my kind of warrior arts. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything you've said that, that speaks against that. I mean, without a doubt, your destiny. And it's wonderful. I mean, as, as you know, as a citizen of the U S you know, we're, we're lucky that you answered that call and, you know, who knows what you got into out there, but you know, more so yeah, now. I'll say Jeremy, this needs to be said is that, sure. you know, when I went into the seals, it was to serve our country out there, <laughs> but guess what? Out there is not out there anymore. It's back here. And also, um, you know, the world is accelerating and, and there's a lot of change happening, a lot of threats going on. And, and I think that, you know, everybody who's listening and everybody's family, you know, or let's just say everyone listening to this who's interested in this. Now it's time to look at the martial art, not simply as self-development, but also as the ability to really handle stuff in your community. Like, you know, I have a great example. One of the guys, you know, we have our 50 hour Kokoro camp and Though it's not a martial arts training, it certainly is an offensive mindset sheepdog training, take care of business type training. And we had a superintendent of a school come through. He went back home and just a few months later, he had an active shooter situation that he completely dissolved on his own. Had he not had the training and um, the courage from the training to, to do something, had he followed protocol, people would have died. And of course, protocol is to call the cops hunker down. Well, he knew that that would lead to death. So he called the cops and he went immediately into the classroom, confronted the guy, grabbed him by the here, you know, by the cuffs, sequestered him from his bag where his weapon was and took him to the ground. And, you know, that's uncommon, but that's exactly what has to happen by everybody on this call. If you see something like that. And so the training to do that is a little different than, you know, just tournament fighting. And, and so I think that everyone who teaches martial arts, you know, can have either a seminar or, you know, some special track around, Hey, this is how you really take care of yourself in a street fight. I know a lot of people are doing that already. So I'm probably speaking to the choir and you can tell me if I am, but um, for the most part, I don't see that, right. People get stuck in their system or their style of you know, what they learn from their master or whatever. And what I'm saying is, you know, that's not appropriate anymore in its, in its totality for the world that we're living in now and the world we're heading into. And so uh, it's okay to change things. I mean, frankly, every martial art was an evolution of a former art or a spinoff. So now it's time to really look at that and say, okay, preserve the integrity of the original, but let's evolve this for both the modern era and the Western mind, which is largely what I've been trying to do with seal fit and my Kokoro yoga, which is really a, a blend of martial arts, yoga and functional fitness. And, um, and then the training, like, like attend Krav Maga or have a Krav seminar or bring Tim Larkin's target focus training in or scars or something like that, because it's super useful and it changes, changes your whole perspective. To answer the, the question you posed there, what some people refer to as reality base or, you know, more combat focus, approaches are at the very least becoming more uh there's a growing awareness even in the sure. traditional martial arts community and even in the schools that aren't implementing anything people are starting to talk about it and obviously awareness has to precede action so I, we're, we're getting there yeah yeah guys like tony blower really helped with that you know in the crossfit yeah. community with his his system i think sure. that spears spears is a great way to kind of just begin to think this way we had Tony on the show. Uh, when when was that? It was over six months ago, maybe even as much as a year ago now. And just uh, in, an incredible episode. He he holds the title for the longest episode. Uh, so long we had yeah. to break it into two parts. That's but, funny. I had to do the same thing with Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't that surprise me? The man can talk, and it's all good stuff. Yeah, no kidding. It's, it's all great. good stuff. He's a good friend of mine. Now I'm wondering. You talked a lot about what you were able to bring from your karate training into your SEAL training. Right. What might the martial artists listening, what, 
I mean, you, you made a recommendation and, and one that I, I will underscore about some additional combat focused training for the listeners. But what other than that, what concepts might the traditional martial artists listening gain from you that you'd be willing to share about SEAL training? Well, I will, I will tie the two together. One of the things I learned from Nakamura is the power of the breath. And, and so we, you know, when you train in, you know, train effectively, you integrate breath you know, the mind breath and the movement right into they become almost inseparable and most people can't separate them they don't they're not even aware of the separate parts that are involved in the mind the breath and the movement so what nakamura helped me do is to unpack them and to appreciate the the movement of the mind the movement of the breath and the movement of the physicals you know structural movement i.e strike kick punch throw whatever um, and then to, to, to integrate them effectively for different outcomes. So I took that into my SEAL training. And so in my SEAL training, I had a very distinct focus on the parts as well as the whole of those three. This is pretty profound, you know, when I now look at, back at it, that I was able to kind of do this as a 24 or 5-year-old. So I would uh, first I would practice breathing. I practiced the breath every day when I woke up. I would connect with my breath. I would practice some of the breathing techniques I had learned, uh, and also innovated. You know, just kind of experimenting with things. And then um, I would practice uh, my mind training. You know, so so bring the Zen in and focus. Learn how to focus. Practice my focusing. Practice my awareness training, and things that I learned later that the seals had training methods for, as well as the breath. So I brought these into BUDS and began to use them. They don't teach them really at BUDS. They teach them in the more advanced training. But what I found was at BUDS, at SEAL training, while, when I started to use these principles by practicing the individual parts and then combining them during my performance evolutions, like time runs, time swims, ocean swims, obstacle course, rucks, you know, and then in the, you know, the hardcore beatdown evolutions like log PT and, you know, just in all the games, excuse my language, that the SEAL instructors would play on us. It was those three skills, the integration of the breath, mind, and the movement that allowed me to stay really present, really focused, and uh, to control the quality, quantity, and directionality of what was going on in my rational mind. So they could always answer the question, of what am I supposed to be doing now and why? And then to focus on a positive next step or positive outcome. And I call that now feeding the courage wolf. And so the, the four skills that it kind of parsed out of that, that I teach, you know, that the SEALs kind of teach now and that I teach to my SEAL fit trainees are one is breath, breath training, breath control. So slowing down the breath, getting it down to five to seven cycles per minute. We can do that with breath control practice, AKA box breathing. The second is, um, you know, the positive, um, le learning how to, to keep your mind in a positive mental state through internal dialogue and then in a more advanced sense through positive internal um, feeling and emotional states. And all those will line up, right? I call that positivity, right? But it's a pretty advanced skill. But the first step of it is we call just feeding the courage wolf, which is, uh, you know, maintaining a positive internal dialogue. The third skill is seeing the win in your mind before you step foot in the battlefield, whether this is a, an entire thing like buds, seeing the win, making sure you, you can believe that you're capable of being a SEAL, or in the moment, like you're getting beat down in log PT, being able to see yourself internally as the warrior who's capable of, you know, carrying the log and supporting your teammate and getting through this, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of effect that that imagery and visualization has on your subconscious self so that you don't, in, in a large sense, if you look at the other, the, the negative side, so that you don't torpedo yourself by having negative imagery, negative kind of subconscious programming rear its head when times get tough, which is usually when people torpedo their own um, goals and desires because they have this subconscious programming they're not even aware of that, that says they can't do it. And so that's the third piece is the imagery 
And then the fourth is uh, knowing or being discerning what task is the right task to focus on that's going to move you toward victory. And I call that task orientation. The SEALs will call that micro goals. So those, those four skills are critical. I began to learn them with Nakamura by parsing out the breath and the mind. And when, when I came to the mind, I learned from him how to concentrate and how to control my internal dialogue and how to see the win before I step foot into the floor or into the fight. And all, later on through the SEALs, I learned how to really, really refine those, uh, you know, for the spec ops missions and then um, how to focus on the right task in the right time for the right reason. So I could always answer the question, why is this happening or why am I doing this? Hmm. And those skills, Frank, frankly, Jeremy, Jeremy the, those skills are the first thing and the last thing we teach, you know, at our SEAL fit training. And, and we drill them relentlessly because they, they need to be practiced every day. They become your uh, internal guides toward self-control, emotional control the ability to kind of dominate your interior domain so that you can perform effectively, um, you know, on, on the outer domain or in the field or on the dojo floor. You've mentioned the seal fit program a few times, and this might be a good time to tell the listeners a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. I, um, back in 2006, I was hired by the Navy to mentor Navy SEAL candidates. I was a reservist at the time. I'd got off active duty and I um, had launched NavySEALs.com in 2000. And through NavySEALs.com, you know, I was kind of mentoring a lot of candidates and we had a lot of training kind of groups pop up. And so I started to learn how to do this stuff. And I was also experimenting with combining, you know, a lot of what we talked about here that I've learned through my martial arts and through my actual SEAL training. And, and I was just getting into CrossFit, all those things, I was kind of blending or integrating into a training model and I wanted to test it on these SEAL candidates, but the Navy wouldn't let me do it. Uh, it came as a blessing in disguise, but a year after that contract was let, I, it kind of got stolen from me by a little company called Blackwater USA. <laughs> and I'm being facetious, they're a billion dollar company. And they literally kind of ripped the contract right off from under my feet. And rather than protesting it, I said, okay, this is, you know, it's one of those things, just step back from this. this is kind of, there's a, there's a silver lining here. And I identified the silver lining as that, you know, I was meant to have, have thousands of customers and do the training that I wanted to do rather than have one customer in the government doing what they told me to do, which wasn't anywhere close to what I knew would work and I wanted to do. So that was the impetus to launch SealFit in 2007. I lost the contract in 2006. SealFit launched in 2007. I started a CrossFit box. The CrossFit box became my laboratory, U.S. CrossFit. Out of U.S. CrossFit came SealFit. SealFit started with hardcore um, crucible training modeled after Hell Week, combining the mental training that I call Unbeatable Mind, largely with you know practicing those big four skills along with teamwork and you know um, awareness development. And so I started training individual spec ops candidates who wanted to, you know, succeed in their pipeline programs. And these are people who were willing to pay me, willing to come and test themselves in our 50-hour event called Kokoro Camp or our, back then our 30-day um, academy, which was kind of our, our mini buds, you know. So we had people come live with us for 30 days. We trained from 5 in the morning until 10 at night sometimes and sometimes around the clock. It was an amazing program. What I noticed is uh, what we found is that these people who went through this training were having over a 90% success rate getting through SEAL training or special forces or ranger, whatever was their goal. And so the training worked. It was really powerful. And I kept evolving it and evolving it. And sooner, um, like really quickly after I launched the first versions of my academy in the Kokoro camp, um, I had civilians asked me if they could come or was this just for the military soft candidate and I said yeah sure I'm not going to water down any of the standards but you're welcome to come and so um, you know fast forward today now you know over 90 percent of our clientele are civilians who really want to learn these skills and test and challenge themselves so seal fit you know is an integrated physical mental training program that uses a variety of tools we have our workouts you know that you use every day we call them opwads we have an on-ramp program called Boot Camp we just launched, which is kind of like our version of combination of CrossFit and P90X and Navy SEAL training, but without any barbells. So it's very effective, injury-free, and we teach the big four skills through the physical training. It's really 
pretty excited about that program. We just launched that that's last week, and that's at our website, sealfit.com. And then we have these um, academies, three and, and uh, three day academies, and a more advanced academy, which is seven days. And then we have these crucible experiences. The 20X is a 12 hour crucible, and Kokoro Camp is the 50 hour crucible. And those are nonstop physical, mental, emotional training. So that's what SealFit is. It's a, it's you know, it really is about a transformation. Um, you know, we're doing it to develop character and, and grit and resiliency and fortitude and those things. Not so much to get fit. We expect you to kind of be fit or use our tools to get fit before you come test yourself at one of these more rigorous, uh, challenging events. And we'll have links to all this stuff at the show notes for anybody that might be new. Whistlekick martial arts radio.com is where we post all of that stuff. You mentioned earlier too, that you had, had written a book, the way of the seal. Yeah, I've got four books out. So okay. that's kind of interesting. Another really cool byproduct of this training is like, I wrote the first book, uh, eight weeks of seal fit as my training manual is actually called the seal fit training manual. And then, um, I had a publisher say, Hey, this is great information. Would you, would you write this for, or, you know, be willing to publish it? And I said, well, maybe <laughs> I said, it kind of sucks right now. Let me rewrite it. So I rewrote it. And then I, I went to a writing seminar and I, uh, I showed it to the, my, you know, the guy who taught the seminar. He's like, well, this is kind of boring. It's like a manual. See, let's spice this up a bit. And so he gave me a bunch of writing assignments and, uh, I got into it and I was like, I realized I had kind of a passion for writing. And so that first book was a New York Times bestseller, Eight Weeks of Seal Fit, and it's still cranking today. And then I wrote The Way of the Seal, which is really my mentally tough leadership book, you know, for for business leaders and organizational leaders and people, you know, trying to, uh, or even Navy SEAL leaders. And that book is being recommended by um, Buds and by others in the military. And a lot of, I think um, we're, we're about ready to do a fifth anniversary edition. So, um, you know, it's, it's sold gosh, like three or 400,000 copies. And my goal is to sell a million copies and people tell me they really get a lot of value out of that. And then my, um, I wrote the, um, the, the entire training philosophy, I would say the sum total of the training philosophy that has evolved, including my personal philosophy of life, uh, I wrote into a book called Unbeatable Mind. And that also started out as a kind of a manual for an online training, a year long online training by that name. And now I'm on the third edition of that book. That's self-published. I think that's great. The difference between Unbeal Mind and The Way of the Seal is The Way of the Seal is really about performing as a leader, as an operator. And Unbeal Mind is really about the inner domain. You know, how do you take control of the inner domain and develop the potential, you know, so that you can do that performance. So they work hand in hand, like, you know, or hand in glove. And then the final book that's out now is called Kokoro Yoga. Kokoro means heart, mind or whole mind. And that's my yoga system that I did uh, in conjunction with my stepdaughter, Catherine, who's been a, you know, 20 year yoga practitioner instructor. And I've been about 15 year yoga practitioner instructor. And we developed a program called Kokoro Yoga, which takes yoga back to a personal practice instead of like studio fitness. And I'm working on another book right now, but the, um, that's a great way to kind of, if someone's interested to, to learn more about what we do is to pick up one of those books. That was my sales pitch. That's about as much as you can get out of me. Hey, and you know what? That that's great. We call that commercial time on here, and it it just it it flowed. So I'm I'm glad you did that. You're quite the prolific author, then. So there there's something there's something in the written word for you. Are you also an avid reader? I devour. My wife is going to cut me off from buying any new books because I have <laughs> stacks and stacks of them near my bed. Um, I need to come up with like a, a better way to read, maybe go back to the Kindle or something, but I just like the physical book. I try to read a book a week. Um, but normally what happens is I'm, I'm, I'm working on two or three of them simultaneously along with an audio book. So generally speaking, I get one of them done a week or the equivalent of a book done a week, but it may not be a single book. Does that make sense? It does. So I'm constantly reading. I carve out time every day to either, to listen, both listen and to uh, read. And um, it's been, you know, it's an important part, I think, of our development and feeding the mind, feeding the courage wolf. There's some fantastic uh, writing out there. Some fat, you know, it's unbelievable the pace of knowledge right now. Like it's, it's really extraordinary to see how fast 
knowledge is being evolved. Right? We are heading into the age of acceleration. And so um, one of my premises is that we have to upgrade ourselves to be able to keep pace and understand the complexity of what's going on in the world. And one of the ways we can do that is through reading, you know, other people's thoughts and ideas on, on what's going on. And so there's a couple, you know, a couple ideas there. Also, the other thing I like to read is just uh, analysis of what's going on in the world, you know, geopolitics and and economics. And so I, I rarely read the actual news because that's all just such negative, you know, crud. But I will read meta um, news through people who, who can parse through all the visual and provide, you know, some analysis. So I like George Friedman. Geo geopolitical futures. I read him. I subscribe to him. Also, uh, John Maudlin is my economics guru. So these guys are like, you know, they, they're like me in the warrior profession. They're the Borgs of uh, assimilating great knowledge and information and then parsing it out and expressing it in a very simple form that, that you can study and read and use it for pattern recognition of what's really going on in the world as opposed to all the noise you see in news. I don't watch TV. I haven't watched network news, you know, uh, in years, except for like the election or the Super Bowl. You know, um, that was the only time I watched TV. So I have a lot more time, you know, to read and to do these things. That was a long answer to your question, but <laughs> there, sorry. No, no, don't apologize. There are no, there, there's, there's no frame. There's no expectation for how short or long an answer should be. I am wondering if you might recommend a couple of you know, a book or two that you didn't write, you know, is there um, something that you think might be appropriate for our, our listeners? Gosh, there are so many, so many. Um, I think though, when it comes to really appreciating kind of what's happening in the world, uh, one of my favorite recent books I read was written by an Israeli guy and it's called um, Homo Deus and it's the history of the future. It's, it's fascinating. Um, another one by a guy named uh, uh, Tom Friedman the guy who wrote The World is Flat, which is also, you know, kind of the 2000 version of, hey, this is what's happening in the future. This is what the Internet means. He wrote something, uh, a book recently called Thank You for Being Late, which really talks about what happened since the cloud. 2007, the cloud, um, the, the advent of the cloud is, is even more astronomical than the advent of the Internet in terms of its impact on our lives. So now what we're seeing is. The internet evolving into a global ubiquitous brain, artificial intelligence brain, and it's the cloud, and now the cloud being infused with AI algorithms that's really changing the nature of what it means to be human. So that these two books are really, really good in that regard uh, to, to kind of learn how what's going on, and you know I, I draw some of my information from them and and. Uh, my, my other one that's like been a, had a profound impact on me is one of my favorite American philosophers and mentor and friend is uh, Ken Wilber. And, um, he, you know, probably the best book to read to start learning about him and in the integral theory is the theory of everything. So there's three that, that can, you know, have a real kick in the Jimmy type um, uh, uh, effect on your own internal reality. What's, you know, your understanding of what's really happening in the world and what's happening, you know, how, how this, how to organize your thinking. There are, all three are kind of meta philosophers, meta thinkers, and a great meta thinker will help you really shift your perspective. And once you shift your perspective, it changes you, which is really cool. Hmm. Let's talk about your goals because I know someone as driven as you has goals. There are things you're working towards, some of it surely is, is spreading the information, the things that you've developed, you've figured out for yourself. And I'm guessing there's a, there's daily practice in there. I think you, you even alluded to that earlier, but what, what is it? What is it and why that's getting you out of bed every day? Well, so personal and business goals are all closely aligned. So generally my personal goals are around becoming the type of personal person who's capable of fulfilling the vision which houses the professional goals does that make sense so um, my professional goals are to impact directly a hundred million people now that doesn't mean I have to train a hundred million people 
but it means I have to impact 100 million people. So I think what that means is I have to train 10 million people directly um, through my various training models, whether that be seal fit, undo mind, Kokoro yoga, or something else that I develop in the future, or just someone reading my books. You know, I've had probably some of the most profound testimonials I've had just from people who've read The Way of the Seal. I'm like, they didn't even attend training, but they took it to heart and used all this, you know, all the tools that I offer, and boom, you know, that transformation. So that's cool. Um, I'm pretty sure we're already at a million, although I don't have a great way to kind of evaluate that, but based upon the number of people who read my books and attended our training over the last 10 years. So I'm about 10% of the way there. And if we can affect 10 million or train directly 10 million people, then those 10 million people can easily, you know, ripple out and influence another 10 people each or nine people each. So we get to our hundred million, you know? So what my goal is with these 10 million is to help them develop what I call fifth plateau awareness, which is an integrated world centric view of the world, world centric awareness where they're fully integrated body, mind, spirit, as well as connected to their higher self or witnessing self and, and feel uh, the separation between self, others, environment, and humanity all start begin to dissolve into a more integrated or wholeness, not not sameness, but wholeness. Meaning that hey, you know, we're all in this together, uh, and also we're all in this with our Mother Earth and and all the you know species. Uh, doesn't mean we're the same, but it also doesn't mean that we're better or worse. That but we are needing it. We're mutually independent or mutually dependent, but independent. And so that is what I call the world centric world world centric warrior point of view. That's what I mean by fifth plateaus. So anyways, without going into all the gory detail, that's going to be the focus of my next book. And so my, my goal is to help people evolve through the training program to that point of view so that they can serve powerfully from their unique, you know, their uniqueness, like their unique offer to the world their personal ethos. And that's where we kind of started this conversation. What I began to evolve and learn when I was on the Zen bench with, with the grandmaster Nakamura was my personal ethos, my unique ethos, which was said, this is who I am. This is what I'm meant to do in the world. And then it's up to me to figure out how to do that, how to fulfill that early in my life. It was as a Navy SEAL officer. And then later on it became, you know, as a business leader and a thought leader, you know, through these books and through, you know, kind of evolving the conversation around what does it mean to be a warrior? So that's, those are my goals, right? And I think we all need to have pretty lofty and audacious goals, but the bottom line is really if, if I or you, whoever's listening can only, you know, only positively impact one person, then you're doing great, right? Because you've are, you've stepped outside of yourself and you're doing something positive for the world. And that's huge. That's the warrior's way. You don't have to impact thousands or millions, but just by influencing one person positively, you could influence thousands or millions. So anyways, I guess I answered your question. There you have it. You did. You absolutely did. I really appreciate your time today. I appreciate you coming on. And I'm wondering if you might leave us with, with a last bit, a last nugget, um, some parting words of wisdom, if you will. Well, remember, ultimately, even though, you know, we talked a lot about the future and I talked a lot about my past based upon your questions, the reality is the only thing that's real is right now is your present. And um, even your memory of the past happens in the present and your vision of the future happens in the present. So ultimately, this is what you got right now. And so, you know, Nakamura said one day, one life. That is true, but the reality is it's one moment, one life, and I would break that down to one breath. Every breath you take, every single breath you take is an opportunity for you to express the very best version of yourself possible. It's an opportunity for you to be aware, and it's an opportunity for you to um, 
avoid you know negative ruts. It's an opportunity for you to to um, serve more powerfully. You know, to disengage from an argument, to disengage from negative thinking. Um, you know, to be real, right? I think that's what you know. Ultimately, why we all train, we train to be better. But the reality is, you can be better right now. It's not some point in the future. It's it's only now. So that's good news, I think. It's hard to deny that he's on a mission to change the world, and he's succeeding. That type of drive is contagious, and it's something I really appreciate. Thank you, Mr. Divine, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with a number of great photos, including two with other guests we've had on the air. Can you guess who? There are also links to everything he's got going on, as well as social media. You can find us on social media, at Whistlekick, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and pretty much everything else you can think of. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Grab yourself a pair of the world's best sparring boots at Whistlekick.com. Thanks for joining me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.